Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2024. Welcome to lesson number 8, Light from the Sanctuary, ready for teaching on May 25. The author of the series of lessons on the Great Controversy is Pastor Mark Finlay, and your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 18. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as this week we study about the sanctuary, we study about our High Priest, we study about the events that occurred in 1844, the disappointment, as we study also about the prophecies that show that Jesus was to come, that he did come, and that he provided salvation available for everyone who accepts him. And Lord, as we study today, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us. We thank you that your word shows us just so clearly who you are, but that then we need the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds to understand it as well. And Lord, people have asked that we pray for them. And today I'd like to pray for Lucy and her treatment for breast cancer and I think she's from Texas, and Wilson from Kenya. Uh, I'd like to thank you for uh, the improvement in his condition, and and also of Dalton. Uh, May the Holy Spirit continue to work in his life. Lord, there are people who are vision impaired or blind in many parts of the world, everywhere from North America to South America to Australia to the Pacific Islands, to Europe and Asia and Russia and Africa in so many places, Lord, people who are searching for you. We pray that this podcast may be a blessing to them. We pray for them around the world. Now, as we open your word, we ask for your guidance and blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week, it comes from Hebrews chapter 8, and it's verses 1 and 2. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected, and not man. Let's read that again, Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. Shortly after the disappointment of October 22, 1844, some of the Millerites came to understand that the 2,300-day prophecy didn't deal with the second coming of Jesus, but with Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary. The cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven was the fulfillment of the earthly cleansing of the earthly sanctuary. To understand this important truth better, look at the parallel between Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. And so we have a table here. On the left side of the table is Daniel 7. On the right is Daniel 8. The first entry under Daniel 7 is Babylon. There's nothing under Daniel 8, and there's a reason for that. And then Daniel 7 has Medo-Persia, Daniel 8, Medo-Persia. Daniel 7, Greece, Daniel 8, Greece. Daniel 7, Rome, Daniel 8, Rome. Daniel 7, Judgment in Heaven, Daniel 8, Cleansing of the Sanctuary. These parallels show the nature of the cleansing of the sanctuary, the pre-Advent Judgment. This week, we will explore Christ's ministry in heaven. And if you want help with this particular lesson, study this week's lesson based on chapters 22 to 24 and 28 of The Great Controversy to prepare for Sabbath, May 25. Sunday, May 19, The Heavenly Sanctuary Read Exodus chapter 25, verses 8, 9, and 40, and Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through to 6. What two sanctuaries are outlined in these verses? First of all, Exodus 25, verse 8, Then 
Have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. And, verse 9, Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And, verse 40, See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And Hebrews chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But, in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. As the early Adventist believers poured over the scriptures in the months following 1844, they understood that there are two sanctuaries mentioned in the Bible. The one Moses built, and the great original in heaven. The term sanctuary, as used in the Bible, refers first to the tabernacle built by Moses as a pattern or type of heavenly things, and second to the true tabernacle in heaven to which the earthly sanctuary pointed. At the death of Christ, the typical service lost its importance. The true tabernacle in heaven is the sanctuary of the new covenant. And, as the prophecy of Daniel 8.14 is fulfilled in this era, the sanctuary to which it refers must be the sanctuary of the new covenant. We read in The Great Controversy, page 417, at the termination of the 2,300 days in 1844, there had been no sanctuary on earth for many centuries. Thus, the prophecy, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, unquestionably points to the sanctuary in heaven. End of quote. The sanctuary in the wilderness was a scale model or pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. The services in the earthly sanctuary foreshadowed God's divine plan of salvation. Every sacrifice offered represented Jesus' sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. We read in John 1.29, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Through the sacrifice of Christ, we are free from the condemnation of sin. Forgiveness is ours. Our guilt is gone as we accept Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf and confess our sins. As you read in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is not only the lamb who died for us, but also the priest who lives for us. Hebrews 7.25 explains, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He removes the guilt of sin and saves us from the power of sin. As we read in Romans 8 verses 1 to 4, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, 
God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus' ministry in heaven's sanctuary is for us. As a result of his intercession, the grip of sin on our lives is broken. We are no longer under bondage or enslaved to our sinful natures. In Christ we are free, free from sin's condemnation and free from sin's control. As we hold on to Christ by faith, we have the assurance of salvation. And so to finish today, what does it mean for you to know that Jesus is in heaven ministering in your behalf, meaning that he is there mediating for you? Why do you need a mediator in your behalf? Why is this truth good news? Monday, May 20, in the Holy of Holies. Read Leviticus chapter 16, verses 21 and 29 to 34. Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 32, and Hebrews 9, 23 to 28. Why was the Day of Atonement so important in ancient Israel? Leviticus 16.21 He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. And then verse 29 onwards, This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month you must deny yourselves and not do any work, whether native-born or a foreigner residing among you, because on this day atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then, before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. It is a day of Sabbath rest, and you must deny yourselves. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the members of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Leviticus 23, beginning at verse 26. The Lord said to Moses, The tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. Do not do any work on that day, because it is the day of atonement, when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God. Those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. I will destroy from among their people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come, wherever you live. It is a day of Sabbath rest for you, and you must deny yourselves. From the evening of the ninth day of the month until the following evening, you are to observe your Sabbath. And then Hebrews 9, beginning at verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once, to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him." 
The priests ministered every day of the year, but on the Day of Atonement, called Yom Kippur in Hebrew, the eyes of all Israel turned toward the sanctuary. Leviticus 16 and 23 give explicit instructions for the Day of Atonement. All regular activity ceased. Everyone fasted. While the high priest entered the presence of God for them in the most holy place, the people examined their hearts. They sought God in humility and heartfelt confession. Anyone who was not afflicted by the Day of Atonement would be cut off, no longer part of the chosen people, as uh, we read in Leviticus 23:27, the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. Hold a sacred assembly and deny yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. In verse 29, those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. On the day of atonement, the high priest took the blood of the Lord's goat into the sanctuary and after sprinkling it on the mercy seat, applied the blood to the horns of the golden altar and of the brazen altar, completely cleansing the entire sanctuary. When he had made an end of reconciling, the high priest placed his hands on the live goat and confessed Israel's sins. Then it was led into the wilderness to be separated from the camp forever, as we read in Leviticus sixteen twenty to 22 When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it in the wilderness. The blood was transferred into the sanctuary during the daily services, showing the recording of sin, as we read in Jeremiah 17.1. Judah's sin is engraved with an iron tool, inscribed with a flint point on the tablets of their hearts and on the horns of their altars, and God's taking responsibility for its ultimate disposition. Now, on the Day of Atonement, it was transferred out of the sanctuary and placed on the head of the scapegoat Azazel, representing Satan and revealing his ultimate responsibility for the sin problem. This goat was led far into the wilderness so that, at the close of the Day of Atonement, God had a clean sanctuary and a clean people. In the heavenly sanctuary, Christ ministers for us, first in the holy place and now in the most holy place since 1844 at the end of 2,300 days. We will get through this great judgment because of Jesus, our substitute. As Ellen White said, in Desire of Ages, page 25, we are justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. End of quote. As a result of this righteousness, credited or imputed to us, we afflict our souls, which is a turning away from sin. That means we have not come to a comfortable acceptance of evil, nor are we excusing or clinging to cherished sins. Instead, we are growing in grace and living a life of holiness. And so to finish today, what is the significance of the Day of Atonement in our lives today? Why should it make a difference in how we live? Tuesday, May 21, the judgment has come. Read Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, with Revelation 14, 6 and 7. What is the similarity between these two passages? First of all, Daniel 7, beginning at verse 9, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, 
And the books were opened. And Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the mid-air, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. The judgment is a prominent theme throughout the Bible, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil, we read in Ecclesiastes 12.14. Jesus pointed his hearers to a future time of judgment when every idle word men will speak, they will give account of in the day of judgment in Matthew uh, Matthew 12.36. The Apostle Paul adds, God will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5. The angelic messenger said to John in Revelation 14 7, the hour of his, that's God's, judgment has come. Read Revelation 22 verses 10 to 12. When Jesus return, what is the fate of all humanity? What clear declaration is made to John? Revelation 22, verses 10 to 12. Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll, because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Since Christ came to give out his final rewards, there must be a judgment before that to show who will receive what reward when he comes. When Christ returns, there is no second chance. Every human being has had sufficient information to make their final irrevocable decision for or against Christ. Read Matthew 25 verses 1 to 13. Why does Jesus relate so differently to these two different groups of believers? Matthew 25, beginning at verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. In The Great Controversy, page 428, we read, When the work of investigation shall be ended, when the cases of those who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then, and not till then, Probation will close, and the door of mercy will be shut. This is the one short sentence. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. We are carried down through the Saviour's final ministration to the time when the great work for man's salvation shall be completed. End of quote. We need not fear the judgment. Through Christ, Forgiveness is ours, 
Freedom from guilt is ours. Power to live godly lives is ours. And the final victory is ours. Wednesday, May 22, the good news of the most holy place. Read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. What assurance and divine invitation do these verses give to each one of us? Hebrews 4, beginning at verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings." having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Paul's point here in Hebrews is hold fast, come boldly, never give up, focus your faith on Jesus, our great high priest. In Jesus, we have all we need. By faith, we may enter the heavenly sanctuary through the new and living way that Jesus has opened for us. Looking into the court, we see blood on the horns of the brazen altar in the holy place. We see blood on the golden horns of the altar of incense. We behold the sprinkled blood on the curtain before the mercy seat. Jesus' blood prepares the way at every step. This gives us hope since we can have reunion with God only if Jesus pardons us and blots out our sins. The mercy of God is infinite, but so is his justice. And justice cannot accept Christ's sacrifice as atonement for our transgressions unless Jesus guarantees first to forgive our sins and second to blot them out. Read Revelation 11.19 in the context of the great controversy. Why is this vision significant? How does it show the inseparable link between the law and the gospel? Revelation 11 verse 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. Here, in the dazzling brightness and the blazing glory of the presence of God, in the throne room of the universe, at the very base of God's throne, we discover the law of God in the Ark of the Covenant. Here, in the most holy place, God's justice and mercy are revealed. No earthly power can change God's law because, among other reasons, it is enshrined in the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. Hebrews 8.10 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Entering by faith into heaven's sanctuary, we find pardon for our past sins and power to live an obedient life through Christ, who died for us and writes the law in our hearts. Jesus saves us to the uttermost, we read in Hebrews 7.25. Let's read that whole verse. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he lives to intercede for them. 
Jesus saves us totally and completely from the penalty of sin and from its power. And so to finish today, why is Jesus' intercession such incredibly good news? As we stand before the law as the standard of righteousness, what hope would we have without the gospel? Thursday, May 23, Jesus, our Advocate in the Judgment. Read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 to 14. What difference does this passage reveal between the priest's ministry in the earthly sanctuary and Jesus' ministry in the heavenly sanctuary? Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 9. Then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Once and for all, Christ died upon the cross as a perfect sacrifice for sin. His priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary sanctifies us. Now, having entered the most holy place, he stands as our advocate in the judgment. We see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. Christ was offered, we read in Hebrews 9.28, once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for Him. Through his sacrifice and mediation, sin has been dealt with. Now he comes again for those who, as it says in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, love his appearing. Read Hebrews 6 verses 19 and 20. Why does he invite us to follow him? And what do we discover as we follow? Hebrews chapter 6 verses 19 and 20. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In the Great Controversy, page 489, we read, The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death, he began that work which, after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. We must, by faith, enter within the veil. Within the forerunner is for us entered. Hebrews 6 verse 20. Then the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. There we may gain a clearer insight into the mysteries of redemption. The salvation of man is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. The sacrifice made is equal to the broadest demands of the broken law of God. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne, and through his mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to him in faith may be presented before God. End of quote. The plan of salvation is a complete plan to resolve the great controversy and to rescue this planet from Satan's grip. Jesus' life revealed God's love to a needy world and a watching universe. His death revealed the hideousness of sin and provided salvation for all humanity. His intercession in the heavenly sanctuary provides the benefits of the atonement to each one who reaches out in faith to receive them. And so to finish today, how does Christ's death on the cross relate to his intercession in the heavenly sanctuary? 
And why is the judgment so necessary to the plan of salvation? Friday, May 24, Further Thought Notice how Jesus' work for us in the judgment and our role are described. Here we go to The Great Controversy, page 484. Jesus does not excuse their sins, but shows their penitence and faith, and claiming for them forgiveness, he lifts his wounded hands before the Father and the holy angels, saying, I know them by name. I have graven them on the palms of my hands. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise, Psalm 51, 17. And to the accuser of his people he declares, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. End of quote. And then another quote from Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, pages 471 and 472. The fact that the acknowledged people of God are represented as standing before the Lord in filthy garments should lead to humility and deep searching of heart on the part of all who profess his name. Those who are indeed purifying their souls by obeying the truth will have a most humble opinion of themselves. The more closely they view the spotless character of Christ, the stronger will be their desire to be conformed to his image, and the less will they see of purity or holiness in themselves. But, while we should realise our sinful condition, we are to rely upon Christ as our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but on his own. And then from the Great Controversy, page 489 and 490, we are now living in the Great Day of Atonement. In the typical service, while the high priest was making the atonement for Israel, all were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people. In like manner, all who would have their names retained in the book of life should now, in the few remaining days of their probation, afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, what emotions are stirred at the thought that Jesus is lifting his wounded hands for us before the Father? Why is this our only hope in the judgment? Two, we are living in the day of atonement. Atonement is the work of God in saving lost sinners. Why then should any day dedicated to the work of God in saving sinners be good news? And three, notice what Ellen White wrote, Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but on his own. And that's from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, January 2, 1908. How can you make this hope your own? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Running from Church, Part 1 by Andrew McChesney Church was the last place Anelia wanted to go. Raised in a family that followed a non-Christian world religion, she had visited her own house of worship on holidays and to observe animal sacrifices for more than 40 years. So it came as a shock when her husband and 20-year-old son, Rosen, were offered a Bible by a stranger on the street. Take this and come to our meeting this evening, the stranger said. He said refreshments also will be available. At home, Anelia balked at the invitation. What are we going to do there, she asked. I don't want to go. I belong to another religion. But Rosen wanted to go to the church. Come, he said. We'll eat and listen to a few things. All five members of the refugee family went to the meeting in the European city. They exchanged greetings with church members, and they sipped tea and ate cake with them. 
During the church program, Anelia heard people talking about Jesus, but she couldn't understand the words. What are they talking about, she wondered. It was a normal reaction for someone from her faith background when first exposed to the Bible. Rosen, however, was fascinated by the meeting. Afterward, he started Bible studies with Paul, the stranger who had offered the Bible on the street. Before long, Rosen asked his mother to come to church for his baptism. Church was the last place Anelia wanted to go. I don't understand what a baptism is, she said. I won't go. Rosen was baptised without her. Then Anelia and her family were evicted from their rented apartment. They had money for rent, but they couldn't find a place to live. Church members joined the search, but to no avail. Church members invited the family to stay temporarily in the children's Sabbath school classroom. Church was the last place Anelia wanted to go, but she had no choice. She and the family lived in the church for seven months. During that time, Paul visited the family and read from the Bible. Anelia wondered why he was reading the Bible. She was convinced that only her religion's sacred writings contained the truth. She wondered, how will this Bible help me get an apartment? Why can't we find an apartment? On Sabbaths, Paul invited the family to attend church services. Anelia fled. When she saw the worship service starting, she ran out the door. But her 22-year-old son, Sergi, was moved by what he heard. He was baptised. After the family found a new home, both of Anelia's sons began to plead with her to consider Jesus.